You pick the softest one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'll give a few seconds here for for folks to join in. Um, so I'm welcome to a, a Yale Psychedelic Science Group uh, talk. Um, I'm, I'm Alec Lerner. I'm a PGY1. Uh, Co-hosting tonight with me is uh, Ahmed. Um, I'm in Mexico here, so I can't, uh, the, the Wi-Fi I'm working with is a bit shoddy. So uh, if, if I disappear, that's why. Um, but I'm very excited to introduce um, our, our speaker tonight. Uh, from the University of Wisconsin is Lucas Reichert. Um, he's a historian with a special interest and expertise in the history of psychiatry, the history of um, plant medicines, um, recently published a book on uh, his, uh, historical uh, concepts with uh, cannabis. Um, I've also read uh, his book, uh, Break On Through, which was a, a lot of fun about radical psychiatry and different movements within um, the history of psychiatry, so really informative. Um, and as we, you know, as usual with our talks, we'll we'll give Dr. Reichert uh, time to give his formal presentation. But um, if if there are questions, thoughts, anything you want to contribute, um, don't hesitate to unmute yourself or to uh, raise your hand, use that function, or put a message in the chat. I'll be monitoring that. Um, and yeah, thanks for being here. Without further ado, I'll pass things over to uh, Dr. Reichert here. So I'll share my screen and I presume it's up there for you to see that title slide. Yes, looks thanks. good. Yeah, I hope everyone is well, wherever you are, whether or not it's Mexico or Madison. I, I really appreciate you asking me uh, to be a part of this uh, this group and asking me to share some research and, and ideas with you. I've prepared roughly 30 slides uh, and I'm obviously very happy to answer some questions for you if you have any and I suppose if I'm capable, uh, just to be clear uh, that I am a historian. Uh, I am not in a lab, I'm not in a clinic. Uh, I'm not linked to any psychedelic businesses, uh, but I will say that uh, I am the historical director of the nonprofit uh, American Institute of the History of Pharmacy, uh, which was established in 1941. And if you do have scope, uh, maybe you can just take a quick look at the at that in the in the Google. Just check it out if you have time. Uh, the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy is dedicated to advancing knowledge on the history of medicine and drugs. Uh, if you'll permit me then, I'm just going to jump right in. And um, my goal tonight is to demonstrate some of the divisions in psychedelic medicine and psychedelic science and psychedelic society. And I wanted to highlight for you uh, some of the interesting primary sources that I've come across that maybe you haven't seen in the past. Uh, my presentation is uh, focused on the 20th century and it's mostly in North American context. I'll just say uh, quickly as a digression that uh, I don't feel uh, as an expert in North American uh, psychedelics that I'm equipped to be um, lecturing, talking to you on indigenous psychedelic use. Uh, I think that there are a lot of wonderful experts out there who do this sort of work, and I can certainly point you towards some of these. I'll try to um, uh, bring in the indigenous perspectives as much as possible, uh, but that isn't the explicit focus of the talk today. So there's an intro that I'm going to give. There's about three chapters and a conclusion. It sounds heavy, but uh, it's really not that bad. Um, I've got a question mark uh, here on this first slide, and that's because there are many questions, obviously, about the emerging industry. Um, but also, when you think about uh, psychedelic substances, what immediately comes to your mind? 
Is it the focus of your clinical work? Uh, is it something that you work on in a laboratory setting? Do you conceive of uh, certain substances uh, as novel therapeutic interventions? Or perhaps you conceive of them as uh, a byproduct of nature and part and parcel of indigenous traditions. Maybe you think um, it's a reason to put money into an ETF or a given stock, or maybe it's some variation uh, thereof. We all know that there is currently uh, much debate about psychedelics utility, their purpose, their potential harms, and the wider state of knowledge about them. And there is debate about how the medical and the, the legal landscape might be shifting. The STS scholar, uh, that's science technology studies, uh, scholar uh, Claudia Schwartz, um, and she's been at the Max Planck Institute, refers to uh, socio-psychedelic imaginaries. And she refers to these uh, types of imaginaries in her most recent work. And what she's talking about is the different conceptions and the different meanings related to psychedelic substances. So what I'm gonna try to do is refer to uh, some of these different types of conceptions, some of these different discourses and I'm using this term psychedelic wars uh, for the purposes of the talk. So the gist of what uh, these, these two quotes are saying is pretty simple when we reflect on psychedelics in the present moment. So Professor Nancy Campbell, who's awesome, a colleague of mine, uh, says drugs never fully shed their past. And at any given time, there are many discourses circulating that have overlapping historical resonance. And I've underlined many discourses because that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. And then Sidney Cohen, who was a noted psychedelic researcher who famously broke with uh, psychedelic researchers of the time in the 1960s, said, History repeats itself, but nowadays it repeats incessantly. So what he was talking about was the rise of MDMA in 1985. He had studied LSD in the early 1960s and he had hobnobbed, rubbed shoulders and bumped elbows with Aldous Huxley, Humphrey Osmond and all the rest that you can think of. But his opinion soured on psychedelic substances and he went a different direction publishing uh, actually against their use. And so in the mid 1980s, when MDMA emerged, he was saying, wow, here it comes again. Now here we are in 2022 and we're repeating uh, incessantly. The types of narratives, the types of discourses that are being advanced in the mainstream media, in all sorts of different types of literature are very important from my perspective. Um, the use or, or misuse of history as well is crucial from my point of view, and I'm gonna try and explain why. So the present moment, um, which we're all familiar with is witnessing a new set of testimonials that are attempting to recalibrate the social capital of the psychedelic experience within the clinic and outside the clinic. And what's the way I'm framing this is a war over psychedelic authority. Just as in the past, Americans are seeking to unpack how psychedelics may function as products of medicine, as recreational substances, as tools of religion, and then just straight up commodities. In 2018, the journalist and the best-selling author, Michael Pollan, uh, entered this conversation and added to prevailing discourses when he published How to Change Your Mind. 
and he introduced readers, lay readers and experts alike to his own psychedelic trips. And this testimonial style intervention has since shaped contemporary uh, opinions on psychedelics and people refer to the pollen effect now. The idea that pollen has galvanized even, even more sentiment uh, and uh, favorable uh, opinions around psychedelics. Now, I've personally been really intrigued in tracking or at least paying attention to uh, the mass media, to public dialogue, to celebrity opinion making, whether or not it's on the Joe Rogan podcast or Gwyneth Paltrow via her Goop network or Tim Ferriss. Um, and the fundamental reason that I'm interested has to do with how narratives um, narratives are constructed, how myths are created, and essentially how ideas that are drawn from history uh, uh, can be reified, concretized um, in the public's mindset. So science, for example, has become recognizable to many people. The layperson has access to I think more knowledge on psychedelic science than in other areas. That's my opinion, but um, I'd be interested to develop that further. Major news outlets are closely reporting what's happening um, within phase two, phase three. People are following more closely what's happening with uh, patent applications. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, profiles in major magazines of thought leaders and pioneers in the psychedelic landscape. And here you see uh, GQ magazine talking to Rick Doblin about how he has begun to work with uh, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, as well as his, his desire for a drug assisted global spiritual awakening. So besides those types of news stories, I'm also very interested in the mass media and Hollywood's portrayal of psychedelics. So celebrity culture can't be ignored in this, cult, uh, in this country and within cultural uh, mindsets. At the top story, you see how individuals such as Jim Carrey, Lindsay Lohan, Terrence Howard, and others have projectile vomited their way to enlightenment and how that's being showcased. In the second story down, you have a, a description of how Timothy Leary, who I'll discuss further in this talk, is going to be featured uh, in uh, a new documentary. And then third down, you see this blending of the metaverse with uh, digital and immersive art and a new uh, television series called The Psychedelic City. All of which is to say that there is a lot of discourses that are flying about in the present moment, meaning we should deeply interrogate what happened in the past. So that was my introduction and I hope you're still with me because we're gonna go into, these are the three chapters. Psychedelics performing as Cold War weapons, that is brain warfare, true serums. Psychedelics performing as breakthrough therapies, cures, tools and medicines of war. And then psychedelics performing as societal antidotes, fixing a sick society. These discourses you'll recognize from what I've already discussed. Now, we have to just reiterate, I think, that psychedelic substances should be understood right now amid a swirling set of controversies. And there is a danger of replicating the failures of the 1960s and the 1970s. And in fact, a lot of uh, scholars, a lot of clinicians, a lot of scientists have, uh, have actively thought about 
and proactively um, thought about how to avoid the mistakes of the past. And so some of those mistakes are, are going to be uh, discussed now. So this is level setting for you. This is just to give you a sense of the timeline that I'm playing with uh, to create benchmarks or, for you. So 1940s uh, through 1965 have, has often been sort of thought of as this sort of heyday of psychedelic experimentation. Thousands of studies are being published in this period. But by 1965, you're seeing uh, basically a label of reassessment and anxiety placed on psychedelic history, psychedelic uh, um, laws, a bill uh, specifically outlined possession of hallucinogenic drugs um, goes into effect in 1965. And then this period also you see a lot of um, anger, a lot of acrimony, a lot of worry and anxiety around how uh, psychedelics are affecting uh, the politics and society in the United States. Now, uh, I wanted to just jump into our first case study, Cold War weapons. So certain psychedelic substances have been and were characterized as weapons of war. This probably is not a surprise to many of you. This is the type of history that is probably best known uh, and most often recounted. Tested by the US Army and the CIA as a potential Cold War asset. So it really stretches back to 1953 amidst uh, fears around the Soviets, around uh, domino theory in the United States and the CIA director, Alan Dulles, uh, Al excuse me, advocated for a new era of what he called brain warfare. And so this program uh, was organized through the Office of Scientific Intelligence of the CIA and coordinated uh, with the US Army Biological Warfare Laboratories and essentially all manner of experimentation, mostly deeply unethical was sanctioned uh, and it was reduced in scope by 1964 and then eventually ended in 1973. What we have is over 20,000 documents recovered through an F IA request in 1977 that testifies uh, how this played out. And the files um, reveal uh, disturbing um, tests um, using mass doses of LSD, psilocybin, and other uh, hallucinogens mixed with uh, it, to varying degrees, sensory deprivation, hypnotism, electroshock. Uh, and this wasn't just on um, prostitutes or CIA operatives, but it was uh, also taking place on prisoners of color. Uh, and I would refer you to the work of Monica Williams uh, at the University of Ottawa, who has done this work, uh, tracing just how uh, persons of color were targeted uh, within the penal system, uh, as well as recovering addicts and prisoners. So this is the most literal example of psychedelic wars. And uh, the individual uh, uh, that was charged with leading this effort, his name is Sidney Gottlieb, and I will turn to him in a moment. But this is really the true story of brainwashing, the true story of uh, a psychedelic war within the United States uh, and how warfare within uh, a Cold War affected uh, psychedelic understandings. And everyone probably knows uh, that this is Angela Lansbury playing the heavy in the Manchurian Candidate, but I just wanted to 
flag that up for you. Now, Sidney Gottlieb, who is the subject of Poisoner in Chief, which was published by Stephen Kinzer in 19, uh, two, uh, 2019, excuse me, uh, was a very complicated chemist who oversaw all of this agency uh, research. He was given license to pursue a project that made him a mind control czar. And this is obviously um, ethically uh, questionable. What's interesting is that the written record, the historical record, doesn't suggest in any conclusive way that Sidney Gottlieb was challenged by fellow researchers or by fellow scientists or psychiatrists in any way, shape, or form. There are no memos, there's no correspondence uh, suggesting any sort of pushback uh, to this CIA uh, research, which is definitely not the case with other types of above ground psychedelic research, which I'll come to in my second case study. But here is uh, Sidney Gottlieb. He's been referred to as the mad scientist, the sinister scientist, and the black sorcerer. And before I move ahead into the second case study, I'll just give you a flavor of the longevity of this type of research. Uh, it didn't just go away. Uh, in 1969, uh, you have a conference uh, that's being held in New York with um, some uh, very important psychiatrists around the United States. The title of this uh, conference uh, was called Manipulating and Controlling Human Behavior by Drugs, Present and Future. And just with a few uh, red arrows, some uh, wildly titled sessions, New Directions and Methods of Drug Control of the Mind, Brainwashing Drugs, Present and Future. Just primary sources that maybe you hadn't seen. So the next chapter of this talk uh, has to do with wars over psychedelics as breakthrough therapies. So the above ground work, this is moving beyond the CIA military work. This is the type of work where you actually have historical documents that you can pull on, you can pull out and look at. So this is uh, the area where we think through uh, uh, psychedelic substances, whether or not it was psilocybin, mescaline, LSD, as, um, as really novel therapeutic interventions. Um, and there were multiple indications uh, in uh, the mid, uh, in the 1960s. Um, so psychedelic researchers um, in hospitals and laboratories I want to get across, struggled with each other, uh, just like today, I suppose, about approaches and methodologies, as well as the public perceptions of their work. So the first example that I just want to throw at you comes from the Spring Grove Hospital, which um, was home to uh, various um, famous uh, LSD researchers such as um, Stanislav Grof, um, Charles Savage, Walter Pankey, uh, and which also hosted um, very um, uh, famous psychedelic researchers from around the country. And uh, in 1965, this group um, developed called a policy statement covering conduct of psychedelic research within the department at Spring Grove Hospital. And this policy statement held that uh, their LSD therapies ought uh, um, that the held that the therapists involved um, should have um, tried the drug themselves. That the best way that they were going to be able to uh, facilitate patients integration sessions to walk them through the, the, the dos dosing stages 
uh, would be with experience themselves. And for the Johns Hopkins uh, professor of psychiatry, John Whitehorn, um, that didn't fly. In his estimation, um, and I'm quoting, I do not believe that it's necessary that the doctors should take the drug any more than it was necessary when studying the therapeutic value of electroshock to have the doctors given electroshock. And so uh, this is just one reaction uh, to this policy statement that circulated widely, but it generated considerable debate. And so I also think it's worth a little bit more attention because of what's going on in the present moment with psychedelics. So this professor of psychiatry at Hopkins, Whitehorn, also discouraged the temptation to exploit the public interest and any desire to gain favorable publicity. These are his words from his letter. What he worried about with this policy statement, which was put out by Springgrove, is that it was essentially doing sort of public relations work. And he thought that that sort of public relations work constituted dangerous diversions that might undermine the scientific competence and integrity of their research. He didn't think also that it was important to win over public sentiment in 1965 or convince the public of the drug's safety. What he felt was that scientists shouldn't be in this PR business. I find it an incredible historical document considering where we are right now um, with the psychedelic landscape. And I just put at the bottom here whether or not he's correct. Was he correct that uh, scientists, clinicians should just focus on the, the, the hard work? Or should they be trying to influence their colleagues? Uh, has the sentiment carried forward? I'm not 100% sure necessarily, but there is still significant debate about the nature of experience and the value of having uh, undergone some sort of psychedelic experience to appropriately uh, deal with patients. And so this is a, a fascinating example from my point of view. Another example about uh, division within, the, uh, within clinical settings and thinking about uh, psychedelics as breakthrough therapies comes from the Mexican-based uh, therapist Salvador Roquette, who acted as a, a lightning rod in the period, just as now. Uh, there is a New York Magazine uh, podcast that has um, galvanized a lot of attention and it has focused on Salvador Roquette's work uh, and uh, his lineage, essentially the way that he has trained up a variety of um, uh, therapists uh, following on. And there is still historical debate on uh, his techniques uh, some people are referring to uh, Roquette as a torturer for the way that he induced terror in patients and induced negative feelings as a precursor to a breakthrough. Uh, and others take a slightly different approach where they call that uh, type of uh, therapy uh, eclectic. So that is something else I, I wanted to point you towards how do we um, how do we as historians I'm a historian you or how do you as clinicians or interested parties uh, regard the way uh, that someone like Roquette is framed in the landscape now the third example that I wanted to uh, tell you about has to do with 
uh, the use of LSD to treat homosexuality. Uh, here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, we had a talk last week about conversion uh, therapy uh, and the way that it um, sparked a lot of anger and aggression with uh, activist communities in the 1960s. I do, in fact, write about that in my book, uh, Break On Through. Uh, this type of approach, uh, using LSD to treat uh, same-sex desires, um, raised a good deal of controversy amongst uh, psychiatrists uh, and therapists. Um, and I'd point you towards the work of Andrea Enns and, and her recent thesis, Wish I Would Be Normal, LSD and Homosexuality at Hollywood Hospital. So that brings me to uh, the third part, uh, the third chapter, and then I have a conclusion for you. And so this is where we are uh, so far in the talk. Uh, we're in part C. Societal Antidotes, Fixing a Sick Society. So this is the, the final discourse um, that is out there, that's circulating. And you probably recognize this from the pink GQ cover where Rick Doblin was featured uh, because he referred to uh, a global spiritual awakening in uh, that particular article, which also isn't uh, a particularly new discourse. That discourse uh, has its roots in the mid 1960s. Some in the medical science community advocated for uh, psychedelic use beyond the confines of a university setting, of uh, a medical clinic, beyond the therapy room. And some examples of individuals who pushed for this are um, probably not surprisingly Timothy Leary. Uh, and um, Ronald Lang in Glasgow, among others. So Garden Wasson, uh, the chap who popularized magic mushrooms in the 50s, called out Leary uh, for this. He called him out, uh, suggesting this was indiscriminate and indiscreet uh, for Leary to be, uh, my, my lights just went off in my office, <laughs> uh, for uh, suggesting uh, that these substances ought to be um, used by the wider public. And so because of, I think, familiarity of Leary, I'm going to focus on him for the rest uh, of, of this chapter. Uh, again, like I promised, I want to show you some primary resources that maybe uh, you hadn't seen in the past. You've probably heard of uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard uh, establishing their projects in the early 1960s. Uh, and, and here is sort of the first newsletter uh, from uh, the group of individuals, Leary at the top, Alpert, Kahn, Litwin, uh, Metzner, and others who formed the nucleus uh, of that group at, at Harvard. They uh, suggested it was a research program on consciousness altering substances. And you probably have a good sense of the story thereafter about how uh, Leary and uh, his colleagues, uh, while once in the good graces uh, of the psychology department and once in the good graces of the Harvard Crimson and the wider academic community, soon fell out of favor. And this had a lot to do with um, dissemination of uh, psilocybin uh, to students, for not showing up to give lectures, and for the notoriety and the publicity that Leary actually sought, which speaks to uh, Whitehorn's perspectives uh, about um, not wanting to uh, um, be in the PR business. Leary wanted to be in the PR business, he wanted a microphone and he wanted to advance ideas around spiritual awakening in the United States and beyond via the use of mind altering substances. And so after his dismissal uh, from Harvard in 1963, 
uh, he decided that he would start a retreat, which was referred to as Millbrook in upstate New York. And uh, Nixon, for his part, referred to him as the most dangerous man in America. Again, this is probably familiar to you, but in 1967, he delivered that phrase, uh, turn on, tune in, drop out. And he wrote best-selling, uh, well-cited books called uh, High Priest and the Politics of Ecstasy. Furthermore, he established the International Foundation for Internal Freedom along with uh, his uh, colleague at Harvard who had also uh, been dismissed, Richard Alpert. And then he converted to Hinduism. He established the Castalia Foundation. And uh, within this particular document, he's advertising experiential workshops where citizens uh, might come to um, have their minds changed. Uh, one quotation is, you have to go out of your mind to use your head. Also in each new or in each generation, a few stumble upon the riddle of the consciousness and its solutions. And then finally, education experiences are designed and guided by former members and associates of the Harvard IFF Psychedelic Research Projects. So they're leveraging that history. Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter now? Well, Timothy Leary uh, gained notoriety, as I said, sought a microphone, as I said, um, and did PR work, as I said. Uh, he was regarded by some as a reincarnation of Jesus Christ, and his legacy looms large in the present moment when we think about the emergent psychedelic industry. It's really tough to um, escape discussions of Timothy Leary um, at conferences um, when you're speaking really in, in any sort of informed way about the, the, the wider history of, of psychedelics. And one scholar, Danielle Gifford, has done uh, sociological and ethnographic research where she is actually uh, interviewing a host of new generation of researchers uh, and their allies. Uh, these individuals um, are very well known to you. Um, and they're working to rehabilitate psychedelic drugs and usher in a new era of psychedelic medicine. And what Gifford um, suggests um, after interviewing uh, a number of people, um, uh, and I won't name names, but she comes up with this idea of Leary symbolizing an impure scientist a bad expert who does not respect and intentionally defies the boundaries of science. And in defying uh, this, uh, these boundaries, the presence supposedly had a polluting effect on the legitimacy of psychedelic therapy. So these researchers that she interviewed would tell her about how Leary contaminated and poisoned psychedelic science. Uh, and to contain that threat and offer an antidote to that poison, what many currently in the psychedelic uh, space are doing is they perform as the anti-Leary, that they deliberately adopt uh, uh, a dress and demeanor that's suggestive of an anti-Leary. And the reason that this, um, performance is played out, as she puts it, is to avoid replication of the past. And uh, she uses the term sober scientists. It's a fascinating book. I, I'd very much uh, recommend it to you. And then just to wrap up before I get into the, uh, the just my concluding remarks, um, I have to just make a quick nod to um, a fellow Saskatchewanian, uh, Abram Hoffer. And in 1967, around this moment when um, Leary was at Castalia and, and touting spiritual awakening, Hoffer suggested 
Physicians are qualified to treat diseases. That is, society expects us to use a medical model and to act as physicians. We have no special training nor competence nor license to deal with all of man's problems. And I object to a masquerade game in which my colleagues take every advantage of their MD and comport themselves like non-doctors. It's an interesting phrase from uh, another interesting historical document. So that brings me to my conclusion, uh, the present, and I suppose uh, looking into the future, I, I hope that maybe together um, we can uh, look into the future. I don't pretend to have uh, a crystal ball or anything, um, but I am gonna just lay this out for you if I can. Uh, psychedelic wars in the present and the future. I think that we need to recognize that there are a variety of different disputes that are related to um, some of the discourses I've mentioned. And then some of the discourses that I've mentioned uh, are going to um, have an impact in the years ahead. So I'm, I've just got six. This is just a starting point from my point of view. Um, one of the wars I suppose I see is between um, the within the sort of clinic versus outside the clinic, um, you have libertarian views that all drugs should be legalized. You have then psychedelic proselytizers um, that psychedelic substances, and I just threw on LSD and psilocybin, could change minds and the world. It sounds uh, like Rick Doblin on the cover of GQ in a way. Then you have uh, a purely medical approach used in medical settings for clinically approved trials, uh, used during clinically approved trials and therapy. There's a whole host of um, issues to unpack when it comes to the number of therapists that are out there, the licensing, the insurance, obviously. Um, another uh, I suppose war in the present and the future has to do with open science, uh, increasing access to knowledge, who has intellectual control over certain substances, and then related to that is who makes money on a specific group of uh, medicines. Uh, and uh, unsurprisingly, I would uh, mention that there are um, angles of indigenous agency and appropriation that have to be considered when we, we think through um, the, the IP aspects uh, and when we think through, um, you know, overall access to um, medicines in therapeutic settings. Uh, I have, I guess, a couple more slides, but I recognize too that I've blathered on a bit. I'll just say that some of the um, discourses I'm tracking at present are, are hugely important around psychedelic therapy abuse and the need for accreditation um, within the School of Pharmacy here and within the master's program here. Uh, we're having discussions around what accreditation would look like. I suspect it's exactly the same in your sphere where you are right now. And uh, we're also discussing DEI, the, the nature of diversity, equity, and inclusion, how psychedelics are whitewashed to a certain extent, how they can be left out of uh, the trials, uh, how persons of color can be left out of trials, how dosing rooms themselves uh, are not culturally sensitive. Uh, and then finally, as I've already uh, referred to, um, the monetary aspects uh, and the intellectual uh, property aspects of uh, psychedelic wars in the future are going to have to be struggled with in, uh, in the future. And this is a particularly divisive issue uh, for some. So uh, I, I guess I'm going to leave it there because I want to ensure that we have space for dialogue. And I just wanted to um, thank everyone for their uh, attention, and uh, it's been a pleasure to share some ideas with you.
Oh, thank you, Luke. This was really, really awesome. Um, I learned a lot uh, in this conversation. I wonder uh, if people have questions off the bat. Um, anyone should be able to unmute themselves. Um, and you're also welcome to post anything you like in the chat. And I can uh, lift that up. But uh, thanks again. This was so interesting. Thanks. Hi, this is Dr. Hayes, Melody Hayes. Um, hi, first I wanna say really phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much. And it was a really great, just overview, not only of the history, but a lot of concerns, this intersection between um, ways of thinking. And I'm gonna go back to your intro and your intro was really about narrative uh, and how that framed a lot of things that we're considering. And, I think one of the things that really came to mind when I heard your intro is that narrative frames not only narrative and ontology, right, and, and cosmology frames not only what we think of as illness, but also what we think of the intervention for treatment. Also, narrative frames what we actually think science should investigate. And so now the, the ways in which we are in a culture where trauma is a dominant theme. So therefore the narrative around psychedelics has been uh, aligned itself with the of trauma. And so I, I think what's coming up for me is the way in which culture actually affects science and affects the observations of, you know, it's not only affects the data, um, the design, but it also affects the observation of, of data. And so this is very like, you know, profound. when you look at this from a cultural perspective, you get traditional understandings of why, of how psychedelics were used in traditional cultures, and now how that translated into the Western culture. And so how that, the narratives about illness, really, because we are in a place where we think illness lies in an individual versus in a culture society, and so I guess I want to invite you to speak more about that because that's a tension that lives inside of me about this narrative and who's, who's telling the stories about what psychedelics do, uh, where they should be used, how they should be used. Um, there's really, there's a thing of epistemic do dominance, right? And who's telling stories, who has the mic? And who's getting funding and who and who has funding. And then really shaping not only the research direct, but just like your understanding of what psychedelics are, what they do, or what they don't do. I would love your comments on that. Thank you. I think those are um, really stimulating, provocative um, observations. I appreciate that um, very much. It raises a lot of uh, really, a lot of thoughts and I'm trying to sort through them and hopefully I can be somewhat eloquent in, in just responding a little bit. I, I immediately think ab about the silences um, in, in the archives and the way that uh, psychedelic histories have been told to date. Uh, that's the first thing that I'm thinking about. And what I mean by that is that the individuals um, who have been foregrounded in psychedelic histories um, really from the mid 1980s up through the present have been very white male cisgender individuals like myself and women, people of color uh, and um, people um, with different uh, um, uh, sexuality, sexualities just have not had the same sort of exposure uh, and that is something that uh, my colleagues and myself are, are trying to rectify uh, because those sorts of narratives are, they exist, but they just have not been unpacked and uncovered the way they should have been uh, until relatively recently. And that's because psychedelic history as a focus of uh, discrete academic study is relatively new to be perfectly honest with you, the history, the body of literature is relatively new. So that's, I guess, my first reaction to your excellent 
comments. I, I, another thing that I, I wanted to uh, raise, I guess, briefly is uh, the way that uh, uh, essentially you have contingency and co-production that is so important in the crafting of uh, cultural, scientific, societal uh, narratives. So the idea of who has the mic now is, is, is something that is shaped by uh, circumstances uh, having to do with, um, uh, with um, privilege. So even the individuals uh, that are at the top of the, the psychedelic landscape right now are reflective of previous historical trends. So you had Humphrey Osmond, Aldous Huxley, uh, you had um, Tim Leary, Artie Lang, uh, and uh, Sidney Cohen, all white male. Now you have uh, Raman Carhart Harris, Matthew Johnson, Michael Pollan, uh, you have Rick Doblin, all white males again. And so I think what we need to think through um, very critically is um, the ways in which these silences uh, of certain individuals are overcome. And I, I, I'm not sure if that's the most articulate response um, that I could have come up with, but I just want to thank you again for your, your comments. And thank you so much for your response. I just want to uh, make say one more thing. Um, because I really want this to be known in the community because I think it was a, hyp a delusional hypnosis in which I was um, engaged in. And through my eth ethnography, my interviewing of a lot of people, random uh, corners or walks of life, people of color uh, and black people in particular are actually using these, su uh, these substances. And the working class people, these are, this is the healthcare worker who takes care of my mother. And why I'm saying this is because there is a refrain that's not useful for communities of color. And so communities of colors are not doing these substances based on a priori beliefs about communities of color versus engaged in actually ethnographic research. Actually, communities of color are doing these substances. And what I'm, why I'm bringing this to light is because I think there's a refrain that causes hypnosis, that causes a bias in research interventions that as though I just think the discrepancy in usage might be overstated um, because there I want to amplify that there is interest engagement and willingness to explore in communities of color that's not represented by the dominant conversation but thank you again for this wonderful your wonderful presentation Hi, Dr. Reichard. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful talk. I think we all really enjoyed it. Um, I had a question regarding, in particular, uh, the use of some of these more ceremonial plants, like you, as you mentioned, ayahuasca, into the, the medical clinical sphere, uh, considering that these more traditional plants have a, a very indigenous ceremonial component to them. How can you bring that component, which is uh, as used by these indigenous cultures as an essential part of kind of the healing process. How do you move that essence into these more medical spheres that oftentimes sanitize and really reduce things down to the molecular level? Yeah, it's a really fascinating question. I'm not sure I'm the appropriate person to be responding uh, about how this process might unfold. Uh, I certainly um, uh, can say here in um, within the School of Pharmacy, we, we've taken efforts to engage with uh, Indigenous communities, and it's the same with um, colleagues um, in my native Saskatchewan, uh, where uh, you, you're seeing um, people of the Native Canadian, Native American church are actively uh, collaborating um, uh, to discuss the syncretism and co-creation of a therapy that might uh, that might do justice um, to uh, a Western medical model, uh, as well as um, uh, preserve uh, and honor the 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 historical, traditional, uh, and ceremonial uh, uh, uses of the substances. 
so uh, so I don't know if I can say how exactly it will unfold other than I think there has to be a uh, dialogue between uh, psychiatrists, uh, between um, scientists and between uh, the stewards of these plants and who have used them for um, uh, hundreds if, if not thousands of years. I, and I don't mean to be uh, dodging the question in, in how that unfolds, but um, I think that it's just important that the, that the conversation is had between various parties. Yeah. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, Lucas, thanks so much for the, the talk. Um, something that the last, my colleague just mentioned, but came to my mind, and I appreciate your overall approach in thinking about the, the narratives and discourses in the field right now. It's something I, follow and, uh, and present on. And there's a few really interesting ones going on and the last person kind of hit on a few of them. But what I see is a real tension between sort of um, right now, uh, discourses framing these drugs primarily through their biological effects um, and at times bordering on sort of magic bullet approaches. Uh, Jordan, you muted yourself, I think, accidentally. Sorry. Um, this idea of the, the magic bullet can, I've seen both on sort of a more biological end, you know, it's, oh, just, just the biological effects, then it leads to this magic bullet idea, or it could be on the other side of a pure spiritual. Um, it was just, you know, uh, an idea that it's a purely a spiritual intervention. Um, and so, so to the, the last person's point as well this uh you know you see the idea that these are sacred medicines so that's coming into the clinic versus the heavy biological um, frames as well as uh, I, I think in some of my work I've taken a bit more of a actually like a psychological kind of approach to to kind of ground it almost somewhere in the middle but it's interesting that that um idea, which I think was represented earlier in the, the first wave of psychedelic assisted therapies and um, is almost kind of left out in this, in some of the current debates. So you do see um, some, you know, debates of them as, uh, or reference of them as tool, you know, tools, something like that, more mechanistic. So I think even within, you know, you have the six um, discourses right now, but even within each of those, there's sort of sub discourses like within the medical field, you know, which does, is it more on this biological end or where, um, especially with psilocybin, that's really um, playing out right now. And then across legalization and ceremonial use. So it's, it is, um, so the, the, I appreciate the approach of, of follow, tracking the discourses. And I think it'll be, uh, important as these things continue to move into society. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate the complexity in integrating uh, traditional knowledges with uh, Western-based approaches to treating um, mental health problems. I've I gave a talk yesterday with the Shakruna Institute, uh, and we we're discussing uh, intellectual property, and um, particularly we were discussing the use of um, prior art, and, um, and prior art is a legal term, for those of you who don't know, that's deployed um, when thinking about different patents. and. Um, one of the issues that came up to your point, Jordan, is um, the burden that is placed on local and indigenous communities in developing a prior art database because they are the ones who need to share uh, information that they that, and sometimes that information about um, about customs and practices um, doesn't want to be uh, shared, and, and so there is this tension about how how 
we are going to, how engagement is going to look like between uh, different groups, different individuals within this emerging psychedelic landscape. And I guess what I'll also say to your stimulating uh, thoughts is that my colleague here in the School of Pharmacy, whose name is Cody Wenther, I don't know if he's given a talk yet for this group, uh, but he's developed a project where he's trying to understand um, the dosing room and how to tailor the dosing room so it is culturally sensitive to different types of individuals. Uh, and so it could very well be that um, the dosing room as we conceive of it um, should be thrown out for certain, for certain people of certain groups, uh, that maybe the dosing room is an antiquated uh, approach yeah, no, thank you. And I think some of what I was thinking of too is the political uh, impacts of the narratives that we are using as well, which I think will really impact. Um, it's in some ways like wars for legitimacy, as you were saying, which is going to impact, you know, post approval. Um, if the the biological magic bullet narrative wins, then what what the therapies look like when they're legalized might look like one way. If um, you know, hopefully a lot of people have advocated for side-by-side -side sort of legalization as well as medicalization so that you still can have ceremonial use be legitimate as well as medical use. So different, maybe different narratives can coexist, but I, I think there also still is a, a, a tension there and what's gonna initially play out and be legitimate and be legal, you know, legal. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for bringing all these threads out. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Could you please comment on your perception of how those six different threads of discourse um, are kind of complementary to each other and which ones are kind of most opposed to each other? Um, for example, I've heard some clinicians express concern that if the drugs were to be legalized, uh, then the medical insurance system probably wouldn't pay for the drugs as treatments. And then uh, the patients who would benefit from having them probably wouldn't have them covered as medical treatment. So um, from your perspective, are there any of those threads that are the most at odds with each other? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I kind of feel like my answer uh, is embedded in your question. Uh, I, I, I certainly feel that there's <laughs> a huge tension uh, between uh, advocates of decriminalization, legalization, and advocates of the medical model. And um, yeah, what I, I, I do see that there is friction uh, in, in that particular space. Um, I, I guess I also see um, that the idea of uh, psychedelic proselytizers uh, as uh, uh, coming into conflict with individuals um, in, places like Johns Hopkins or UCSF, or uh, maybe, even, maybe even here. And one thing that we've uh, thought about at UW-Madison with, with our, our center is um, trying to short circuit that particular tension uh, and, and, and pivoting towards um, a harm reduction uh, approach where we're thinking through very seriously, very critically about what kind of educational programming uh, that we could offer um, so that we don't have to deal with this. The evidence, at least to my mind, is pretty persuasive that, um, that people can use uh, psychedelic uh, substances in legalized or decriminalized settings safely if they have the right type of education. And uh, a center like ours 
um, a UW has the opportunity to help shape that sort of discourse and also avoid uh, that, that sort of uh, that tension or that war. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. And I know Melody, uh, Melody has raised their hand. I just wanted to uh, thank you. I just want to respond to the very um, incisive question of the, of the person as a physician and also as someone who's advocated for decriminalization successfully in the city of Oakland. I would say that models, dual models are, are readily available to our consciousness, which means that there are things such as medically supervised, uh, medically supervised weight loss is a is a lay practice, weight loss is a lay practice and all there is medical practice for it. Likewise, pain management, right? So we have the medical interventions for pain management, but we also have acupuncture and all these other interventions that physicians give referral to, to people to go to lay community treatments. And so really model that's available is the medical model is providing clinical expertise for, um, for the therapeutic approaches. And if you look at like any basis, any clinical research for on any depression, opioid reduction, anything like that, if you combine these things with therapy, they're more effective. And so there's already dual models for many uh, like illness conditions where there's a community-based intervention and then there's a meta-based intervention. So I just want to offer that as a, a way of thinking about the problem. Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple of folks. I think Ivan was first, so I'll let them unmute themselves um, to ask their question. Okay, hello, and thank you very much for your sharing. And I would like to um, ask two questions regarding um, your sharing. So first of all, um, in, in terms of the um, camp of advocating for this medicine, there's a camp where you would want to really focus on medical use where it is a very concentrated on um, like medical institution, but at the same time, that will re be really at odds with um, another thought, which was like really came from the 1960s where Timothy O'Leary is like, give psychedelics to everyone. So how do you reconcile this sort of tension? And a more particular question is about um, uh, the Notor uh, how psychedelics is notoriously, the experience of psychedelics is notoriously difficult to capture. So how does that, um, how does that play a role in the research and how does that play a role in reshaping the, or like um, constructing the narrative of um, psychedelics and to push it towards legalization and how does that like kind of help people who are against it? So I want to like, I want to know your thoughts on this sort of tension. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. I'll do my very best to answer your questions. Uh, and from my perspective, um, the the notion of medical use uh, in the present day versus giving it to anyone uh, is, 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 if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, a, a tension that potentially um, could derail uh, FDA or scientific efforts to get uh, a certain substance, psilocybin or MDMA, through the FDA regulatory process and then into the medical marketplace. And this is absolutely uh, the fear that uh, Gifford talks about in her book, uh, Acid Revival. And so uh, psychedelic scientists, uh, uh, as she puts it, um, uh, are framing themselves as sober scientists uh, and avoiding the term impure scientists. And so what happens as a result of that, at least in her analysis, is that uh, there's often a reluctance on the part of uh, 
people who are in the psychedelic space and who are leading studies to be um, promulgating harm reduction or decriminalization. That, it, that it's very difficult to, um, from, again, this is her analysis, it's very difficult to hold these two, um, these two uh, perspectives at the same time. The idea of operating in the medical realm and then operating in a decriminalized, legalized realm. Now, that's the argument that she makes after doing this ethnographic work. But of course, what uh, Dr. Hayes has said uh, is that there is, uh, there is a different sort of mental model or mindset that's uh, possible to advance uh, to advance uh, these sort of um, the dual uh, goals. So um, I think that really the the answer to your question, your first question, um, was, was put forward earlier by by Dr. Hayes. Um, what you asked secondly has to do with uh, capturing again. I'm. Um, I hope I'm answering your question uh, appropriately, but capturing uh, the psychedelic experience and how do you create a narrative around uh, a variable psychedelic experience? Uh, now, remember, I'm a historian. That's uh, what historians do is we look at, at um, case reports and trip reports uh, and then, um, the ways in which uh, physicians have written about the patient in the dosing setting. So um, Ivan, one of my first gigs actually um, after getting my PhD was doing transcription. And uh, I was uh, transcribing a bunch of uh, case reports uh, from uh, mid 1960s at Hollywood Hospital in Westminster, British Columbia. Um, where Ross McLean uh, had been giving LSD to his patients, including Cary Grant, we later found out, among others. And so my job was to take these um, reports, so the patient histories, and then the actual um, reflection documents, and transcribe them. Then they went into a database, and then you can data mine the these trip reports and you can sort of keyword search and you can look for patterns so you might be surprised actually about the similarities and in interpretations of people uh, when they're undergoing uh, a standardized dose of psilocybin over a five-hour period they have this, a lot of very similar feelings and comments and um, types of visions. Uh, and so from a historian's perspective, that's how I have uh, tried to encapsulate uh, this experience. Um, I don't know how it works for others. Maybe others he here want to comment. And if no one else does, I would just say I really appreciate uh, Ivan you taking the time to listen and to and to ask those those thought provoking questions. Thank you very much for responding. I know um, Jesse here has uh, raised their hand. Can unmute as you will. Thanks so, so much, Alec, and, and thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation. I, uh, I was wondering, you know, given the, um, the, the history of, uh, of, of the practice of psychedelic therapy, how we avoid some of the mistakes of the past while also moving from uh, the, the discipline as it stands now, which is really limited in a legal sense to a, the clinical setting to you know the therapeutic medical and also um you know, sacramental use uh, as you know the indigenous modalities of the of the practice of this medicine um certainly have a really important you know uh, part to play in uh, maximizing the public benefit of uh, of psychedelic medicines and and how to do that in a way that avoids uh, some of the some of the 
mistakes that led to the embargo, uh, so to speak, that occurred in the in the late sixties. Uh, really staggeringly good questions. Um, I'm going to do my best, Jesse. Uh, so, on a long enough timeline, I think that uh, psychoactive substances uh, like psilocybin, LSD, represent what might be a heroic cure when it comes to mental health. So, uh, you've had a variety of heroic cures that have been advanced, um, hydrotherapy, electroshock therapy, insulin therapy, lobotomy. Um, you've got in the history of uh, mental health and asylums, sometimes a very dark chapters where people were um, placed in, in, in all sorts of uh, horrible situations. And um, the historian Edward uh, Pressman has written a, about heroic cures, the ways in which mental health uh, uh, professionals are, are going to grab onto a specific uh, new therapy to use for their patients. Um, in 1804, uh, the uh, identification of morphine was something um, that alienists really wanted to use um, within asylum settings to help pacify um, their, their, their patients. Afterwards, um, in treating uh, mental health disorders, uh, cocaine uh, was used. Uh, and this is coming from my dangerous drugs and magic bullets class here at UW. And so I think we have to be very careful in how we conceptualize uh, psychedelic medicines as, um, a, as wonder cures or just parts of the toolbox. So are these fantastical brand new drugs that are gonna change the mental health landscape and alter uh, mental health across the United States? I'm not sure about that. I'm also not sure that that's sort of the, the angle that um, we, we wanna be skeptical, I, I guess, of that particular angle. Um, if we want to deal with deaths of despair, I suppose um, what we've seen, uh, at least uh, in, in my humble estimation, is that leveling the playing field with access to healthcare, access to um, safe water supplies and food and a, a weekly check is going to do a lot uh, to uh, help people overcome uh, certain uh, mental health problems just as much as uh, a heroic cure like psilocybin or LSD, which isn't to undermine their promise. It's just to be objective and to think seriously about how, um, as reasonable people, we're going to conceptualize these uh, these substances. So there's a balance is going to be important uh, when we, if we're going to be avoiding um, mistakes of the past. Uh, in your second question about um, about uh, differences between groups and how to uh, appropriately involve um, uh, ceremonial practices, sacred traditions that go back hundreds of years. I don't think that I have a great answer for you, man, honestly. Um, it might be a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but one um, solution that I have heard uh, advanced, and one that seems to make a little bit of sense, is uh, when it comes to intellectual property that there is a degree of um, uh, patent reform efforts taken so that people uh, of certain uh, ethnic backgrounds and groups uh, who have been using substances um, culturally for a long period of time could have some sort of exemption from uh, IP restrictions. So, uh, you know, once uh, a company has a patent out on on mescaline, or once a company has a patent out on uh, psilocybin, the groups that have been using these types of plants and their derivatives for a long period of time wouldn't be subject to 
uh, any sort of prosecution using sort of this Western based um, intellectual property framework that has been applied on them. But that's just one solution that I've heard. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if that also uh, adequately addresses uh, your excellent question, but thank you. And uh, Andrew, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, when I think about the use of substances illicit or prescribed, um, I think about some underlying distress or vacuum or need, um, both at the individual and the psychic level. Um, and being like younger and not historian, I'm curious to hear how you see the similarities and differences in the zeitgeist of like the 60s versus now and um, yeah. So I guess I would say just quickly to your question that the boundary between licit and illicit and legal and illegal and medical and non-medical is a these are relatively new phenomenons uh, that really don't stretch. I mean, it's 1906 and 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 earlier that you you see the the blurring of these uh, domains, of these realms um, of legality, illegality, uh, and um, licit illicit. Um, it was much more porous than it is now. And so the, the patent medicine industry in the United States um, is, is one that you, you probably have a good handle on, uh, but I'll just tell you this, that um, you could walk into the drugstore in 1902 or 1903, and you could get opium-based products and you could get cocaine-based products. Uh, and um, there was no sort of um, legal architecture in place uh, that prevented you from, uh, from doing so. Even if you were a young child, you could go in there with uh, your tuppence and get yourself a bracer, a bracer being a shot of cocaine mixed with alcohol and you'd be on your merry way. Um, the point is that, um, you know, on a long enough timeline that the people whether or not they had a clinical diagnosis of some sort of uh, mental disorder, if they were pathologized in some way or not, were seeking out intoxicants for uh, recreational purposes. Um, and there, that was also a means of dealing with psychic trauma that they may have um, been experiencing. So, all I'm trying to get at is that the, the bifurcation is, is a relatively new one. These um, boundaries um, that we've established here in the country are new. How do you see the similarities and differences between like the psychic needs of 1960s America and like modern America? Well, that's, that's a heavy question. Uh, I, I can point you to a few books, um, but I'm not sure that I'm equipped to be telling you about the the, the psychic uh, the, the psychic well, you're needs. Curious, so I'm going to assume you're qualified. Yeah. Uh, what about Andrew? Sending me uh, a message after this, uh, emailing me, and I'll happily uh, point you towards a few books um, mm -hmm. uh, that can uh, elucidate. I think better than I can. Uh, what some of the psychic needs were of Americans in the 60s. Suffice to say, um, there was a lot of upheaval in the country having to do with Vietnam. A variety of uh, tectonic plates were shifting in the country that had to do um, with um, reckoning with racism, reckoning uh, with sexism in the country. And this sort of uh, upheaval or tumultuousness was frightening for uh, sectors of the population. Do you, do you think there was the same sort of sense of, uh, I don't wanna say emptiness or meaninglessness, but 
uh, that whatever the sort of distractions of modernity are um, helping people not face, do you feel like that existed in a similar way? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give a plug for my 2019 book at this stage, so forgive me. It's uh, called Break on Through, and uh, it's about radical psychiatrists um, in the early 1960s who were trying to understand um, some of the, the struggles in mental health and in the United States and what they identified, these specific psychiatrists, um, uh, who formed what they called a radical caucus in the American Psychiatric Association uh, was um, alienation in the country. And uh, there was widespread alienation that needed to be redressed in, in the United States. And this radical caucus that is really the focus of, of my book um, were pressing their colleagues in the APA to, to think more seriously, think more critically, uh, and with a more of an activist mindset to, to think through um, what the field of psychiatry ought to be doing um, in the country, what kind of uh, efforts could be taken uh, to be dealing with militarism and the ways in which certain uh, segments of the population were being treated. Thank you, that's really helpful, especially the part about alienation. And I know uh, Matt, I, we're running real short on time here, but Matt, Matthew Collins in the chat had raised his hand, um, may have a question. Yeah, thanks very much, Alec. Um, thanks for your talk, Dr. Reichert, um, it's great. Um, I, uh, I wonder, we, you started talking about framing and the, and the need for sort of, uh, well, rather the, the power that framing has. And, um, and I was observing in, in the, in the uh, title of your talk that you, you begin with this word war and the history of psychedelics in, a, in, in that environment. Um, and I guess this might sort of point to whether or not where, where you might stand in terms of whether or not you're a uh, sober historian or not. But, but, um, but to me, it seems that the, there's something endemic to the psychedelic experience and its spirit, which is anathema to the idea of conflict uh, or militancy. And, um, and so I wonder if you've given some thought to that, reflected on that idea, um, in particular, perhaps how people who are anti psychedelic or uh, fearful of it or have a, a, a bigotry toward it uh, might be in, engendered by this notion that there's a war that they can participate in. I really appreciate those comments. Thank you. Uh, I suppose my response has to do um, what I've been reading recently about psychedelics as being nonspecific amplifiers and uh, the suggestibility um, that's engendered with their use that uh, essentially uh, psychedelics in themselves um, don't drive uh, an individual like myself to the left or the right or the middle, it doesn't make me wanna hug trees more or make me wanna go out and hit anyone necessarily. But what it does is it enhances um, what's around me and, and there's a certain degree of suggestibility uh, involved when one takes these. Uh, and I found the literature um, around this topic um, to be very thought provoking, just like uh, your, your question. And I suppose, um, I'm going to have to uh, reflect a little bit more on um, nomenclature, uh, uh, terminology used. Wars, of course, um, uh, as it was deployed in this talk, um, was a little playful uh, and a little bit provocative uh, as opposed to just deliberately cribbing uh, uh, Claudia Schwartz's uh, work on socio uh, 
psychedelic imaginaries, I wanted to um, just riff off that a little bit um, by playing with wars. And I guess I would uh, say too, just as a very quick plug that uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a, a new co-authored uh, chapter called uh, Psychedelic Wars um, in a book called The War on Drugs, uh, which uh, has just come out. So if you're interested in that, please get in touch and I can send you uh, a PDF. Um, some of the some of the verbiage in this talk was drawn from that, that chapter. And I'd be happy to share it with you if you um, wanted to get in touch. Yeah, I would. Thank you very much. We'll do. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Well, um, Luke, thanks so much. This has been a fantastic talk. Um, I put uh, your email uh, in in the chat and uh, hope that was all right. Should have asked permission, but you seem open to it. So yeah. um, great. Well, I hope people have a chance to connect with uh, Luke and uh, we thank you again for, for giving this fantastic talk. It's so important to be thinking about it history uh, as we move forward in this in this um yeah this new era but all, not all that new now that we think about the history so uh, this is great um thanks again thanks to everyone thanks you alec thanks ahmed